Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Yeshua, and I'm the uh, Outreach and Social Media Coordinator for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. On behalf of CCSN, I'd just like to uh, thank you for attending today's webinar, Breast Cancer Screening, Which Way Forward? Um, if you're new to one of our webinars, uh, let me just take a moment to give you a brief overview of our organization. The Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, or CCSN, is an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about the complexities of our health system, connect with others to plan action, and act on those plans to promote better care and healthier survivorship. Um, if you'd like to learn more about CCSN, please visit our website at www.survivornet.ca. You'll find plenty of information there on us, as well as um, news, events, and, and other resources that we think you'll find helpful. Um, and two more quick announcements before I hand things off to our presenters for today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on YouTube. Uh, the video link will be sent to the email you provided when registering, so you can share this resource or go back to it and watch it again if you'd like. Um, and at the end of our presentation, we are hoping to have a short Q&A session However, don't feel the need to wait until the end. You can um, feel free to type in the questions in the window at the bottom right of your screen so we can have them queued up for our guests today. So with that said, uh, CCSN is pleased to welcome our two presenters. First is Dr. Paula Gordon, a clinical professor of radiology at the University of British Columbia. And then we'll be hearing from Jenny Dale, co-founder and executive director of Dense Breast Canada. Thank you for inviting us to speak. I'm going to talk about screening for breast cancer, but I'll use the term screening to refer to cancers in those who haven't had cancer. And I'll use the term surveillance to describe follow-up of women who've had breast cancer. These are both different than when we do mammograms for women who have lumps or other symptoms of possible cancer. Here are my disclosures. I'm here on a volunteer basis. I know that many of you attending today have had cancer, but for the sake of your friends and family, and for those of you have, who have not had cancer, I'm going to explain the importance of early detection of breast cancer, whether it's a woman's first cancer or a new or recurrent cancer in a woman who's had breast cancer. I'll touch on why the screening guidelines process that affects millions of Canadian women is flawed. I'll stress the evidence for screening women starting at age 40. I'll talk about the evidence for extra screening for women with dense breasts, whether they have or haven't had cancer. And I'll briefly mention some of the various tests that can be used. Most of you are aware that the risk of breast cancer is higher in women with a family history, especially in a first degree relative like a mother or sister. But women are often surprised to hear that 85% of breast cancers occur in women with no family history. And that's why all women need to be screened. Many of the principles of screening also apply to surveillance. We want to find cancers early to save lives, but also to allow for successful treatment with less aggressive therapy. It's important to find cancer as early as possible. Statistics in Canada are that overall, 88% of women are alive five years after they're diagnosed, but it very much depends on what their stage their cancer is. We find cancer at stage one in 65% of women. And when that happens, 100% of women are alive at five years. That's the good news. But it's not all good news, of course. Five-year survival goes down as the stage of diagnosis is more advanced, which shows the importance of early detection. Average five-year survival for women diagnosed at age stage four is only about 22%. There are different ways to look for cancer. Mammography is the gold standard, and in Canada, that's limited to 2D. But some of the other tests on this list can be used in special situations, and there are newer ones gaining ground. But please know that thermography has been thoroughly discredited. It is not an effective screening test to find early cancers. We know that annual mammograms starting at age 40 save the most lives. But that's not done in Canada, and that's because the Ministry of Health funds a non-expert panel called the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Healthcare that says that women in their 40s should not be routinely screened. And they influence screening policy in many provinces and territories. But here are the recommendations of the Task Force for Average Risk Women. 
They recommend against routine screening for women in the 40s because in their opinion, the risks are higher than the benefits. They also recommend that women 50 to 74 have mammograms only every two to three years. Well, waiting two years instead of one gives cancers more time to grow before they're found and every three years is worse. The task force says that women shouldn't do breast self-examination that I'll call BSE and that healthcare providers shouldn't do breast exams. They also say that women with dense breasts don't need supplemental screening. Now I called them non-experts. So who's on the task force? They're experts in methodology, but there are no experts in breast cancer. The head of the panel that made these guidelines is a kidney specialist. And along with some nurses and family doctors, there was also an occupational therapist and even a chiropractor, but no oncologist, breast surgeon, or radiologist. Every test has benefits and risks. There are several benefits of early detection. One of them is saving lives. This is a graph of the number of cancer deaths avoided in Canada since screening started in 1988. The orange line is the number of deaths that would have occurred if the death rate stayed the same as it was in 1986. And the blue line is the actual number of deaths. So there have been 32,000 fewer breast cancer deaths since screening mammography began, which is an indication of the huge success of both screening and improved treatment. This research from Canada showed that overall, women who have mammograms are 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than those who don't. And women in their 40s are 44% less likely to die. So if you want to reduce your chances of dying of breast cancer, it makes sense to start having mammograms at age 40. The task force ignored this research. And unfortunately, only four provinces in Canada allow women to self-refer starting at 40. The rest don't start till 50. Besides reducing deaths from breast cancer, there are three other significant benefits of early detection. Instead of mastectomy, lumpectomy is an option when cancer is found early. That's a benefit of early detection that the task force ignored. You probably know that this is lymphedema, the swelling of the arm and hand is a side effect in about one third of women who have armpit lymph node surgery done as part of breast cancer staging. It's permanent and life-changing and significantly affects quality of life. When cancer is detected early, women can have another test called a sentinel node biopsy instead, and it has a much lower risk of lymphedema, around 2%. Women deserve the opportunity to avoid this complication, but the task force ignored this important benefit of early detection. And now many women can avoid chemotherapy if their cancer is small and there are no positive nodes. The task force ignored this benefit too. So we should start screening all average women annually at age 40. And starting at 40 is especially important for Black, Asian, and Hispanic women. They have earlier onset and peak of breast cancer incidence in the mid 40s compared with Caucasian women whose peak is in the early 60s. The way some statistics are presented can trivialize the impact of cancer on younger women. This is from a Government of Canada website, and it states that 83% of cancers occur in women over 50, implying that cancer is uncommon in younger women, so there's no need to fuss over them. But breast cancer does get more common as women get older. It's uncommon, but not rare, in women under age 40. But this graph from the UK research shows that the big jump in incidence is in fact at age 40. And although breast cancer is less common in younger women, it's more aggressive in those women because of the presence of, presence of ovarian hormones. So it's not trivial. The Canadian Cancer Society estimated that there would be 27,700 new breast cancer cases diagnosed in 2021. That would mean about 4,700 new cases in women in their 40s, which is not trivial. Women in their 40s are often caring for young children and aging parents. They're working and contributing to the economy. They are not expendable. They deserve to have the opportunity for early detection of their breast cancers to reduce deaths and give them the option for less aggressive treatment. Yet, as I said, only four provinces in Canada allow women to self-refer starting at age 40. So what are the risks of screening? Well, one risk that women should be aware of is false alarms. They can happen with any screening test, including mammograms, pap smears, and so on. For every thousand women who have a screening mammogram, on average, 70 or 7% are called back for additional tests. 
Now these recalls certainly cause anxiety, but it's transient. And that anxiety has been shown to be reduced if women are warned about the possibility ahead of time. False alarms are most common after a woman's first mammogram, and they're usually not cancer. The majority of those women will need only one or two additional mammographic pictures, and then they can be assured that all is well. Some will need ultrasound, and 11 of the 70 women who get recalled will need a needle biopsy. Now those are done with local anesthetic and they should not be significantly more uncomfortable than a blood test from the arm. And four of the 11 needle biopsies will show breast cancer. This chart is from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. You can see that the false alarm rates for women in the 40s and the other decades up to 70 plus, and they're almost identical. Recall is always higher, the blue box, when a woman has her first mammogram and then it decreases. And the same applies to the number of biopsies performed. So there's no reason to make women wait till age 50 to start having regular mammograms. And so you can see that the cutoff of age 50 has no scientific basis as a threshold for screening. False alarms do cause anxiety, of course, even though only about five or 6% of women who are called back are diagnosed with breast cancer. Now the task force thinks that we should spare women the anxiety of false alarms, and that's why they recommend starting screening later and screening less often, even though they know that more women will die. Do women think that false alarms are a reason to stop, uh, sorry, to not recommend screening? Well, researchers in Pittsburgh studied this. They surveyed all women attending for routine screening over a five month period, and 97% said that they would have regular mammograms even if it meant having a false alarm. And 82% said they'd be willing to have a needle biopsy if it might increase the chance of detecting a cancer earlier. In my day-to-day -day practice, the women who are the most stressed are those who find out that they have a big cancer and that it may have spread to the lymph nodes and perhaps it could have been found earlier. They're the ones that are anxious and they're justifiably angry. Another risk of screening, is erroneously called overdiagnosis. It's the theoretical possibility that a woman diagnosed and treated for breast cancer will die of something else before her cancer would have killed her, like heart disease or like a different cancer or a car accident. The likelihood of overdiagnosis in younger women is almost zero because they're less likely to have developed other diseases. The task force claims that around half of all cancers are overdiagnosed, but reliable research shows that overdiagnosis occurs in one to 10% and probably in the lower uh, end of that range. And many women are willing to accept screening risks in order to reduce the likelihood of dying of breast cancer. But women should be informed about these two risks and decide for themselves whether or not to be screened. Women who have mammograms are 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than women who don't. And they have to weigh that against the risk of transient anxiety, and a one to 10% possibility of overdiagnosis. So when should screening stop? The task force says age 74, and some provinces have defaulted to that. But breast cancer risk increases with age. And if you don't die of something else, your risk of breast cancer keeps climbing. So if a woman's in good health with a life expectancy of 10 years and is well enough to have treatment if we do find a cancer, then it's worth continuing screening to find those cancers when they're small and more easily treated. From Statistics Canada, the average life expectancy for an 80-year-old woman is 10 years. So stopping screening at age 80 would be reasonable, but it depends on a woman's general health and her personal values. So ideally, all average risk women should be offered annual screening starting at 40, but mammograms aren't perfect and some women need more. Women with dense breasts and women who are higher than average risk may need other screening in addition to mammograms. And that applies also to women who've had cancer. They're at increased risk of cancer coming back, which is called recurrent cancer, or developing a whole new cancer. They need annual mammograms and often also need ad uh, additional tests. Dense tissue is the main reason that cancers can be missed on a mammogram. And that applies also to women who've had cancer. Here's a typical cancer on a screening mammogram in a 55 year old woman. And the reason I'm sure it's cancer is because of the irregular edges that you can see on this zoomed in picture. This is a uh, typical cancer and um, we know that we can see it because the cancer is white and the rest of her breast is dark gray. So please remember what this looks like for the next couple of slides. 
Radiologists divide breast density into four categories from A to D. Now, look at how different these four breasts look, and they are all normal. On a mammogram, fat's dark gray, and normal breast tissue is white. Cancers are also white, as you just saw. Categories C and D are regarded as dense, and they have much more normal white tissue than categories A and B. The whiter or denser the breast, the more likely that a cancer will be hidden. Now, breast density can decline with age, but it doesn't always. This woman's breasts are category A, almost entirely fat, and her mammogram is mostly dark gray. The white lines you can see are mostly normal blood vessels. If she had that cancer from a few slides ago, we'd have no trouble seeing it. These breasts are normal too, but they're much whiter, and she's category C. They have lots of normal dense tissue, and it becomes harder to see cancers, which are white, in a background of white. Now, we might see that cancer in her if it developed here, but it might be hidden by her dense tissue if it developed here. And this woman's breasts are category D. Even a large cancer can be hidden in this woman. Mammograms miss up to 50% of cancers in women with the densest category D breasts. This animation shows how a small cancer easily detected in a fatty breast can be masked in a dense breast or even in a small amount of dense tissue in a category B breast. Now, some of you may already know if you have dense breasts, but some may be wondering if you do which category you are, and you should find out. Some of you may have been diagnosed with cancer when you found a lump after you'd had a negative mammogram, and those are called interval cancers. When cancer is hidden in dense tissue and not found on a mammogram, it continues to grow until it's feelable and it potentially spreads. Interval cancers are on average larger at diagnosis and more often known positive than screen detected cancers. They tend to be more aggressive and they have a poorer prognosis. Interval cancers are 13 to 18 times more common in women with dense breasts. So an important goal of screening is to reduce interval cancers. Those missed cancers in dense breasts are the reason that women with dense breasts don't benefit as much from mammograms as women with non-dense breasts, which was confirmed by the study from the Netherlands. So women with dense breasts are discriminated against if they have access to only mammography for breast cancer screening. They need more. We still hear about women who had a cancer that was missed on their mammogram and who are told that they only need mammograms for surveillance. That's ridiculous. Here's something that even many doctors don't know. Breast density can only be determined by a mammogram. There's no relation to breast size or texture, so you can't tell by physical exam. Lumpy or firm breasts are not necessarily dense. Both fatty and dense breasts can feel soft, firm, or lumpy. The biggest risk of dense breasts is the masking of cancers, but here's the perfect storm. We've known since the 1970s that breast density is an independent risk factor for developing breast cancer. Women with the densest breasts are four to six times more likely to get breast cancer than women with fatty breasts. Having, fat, having dense breasts is a more common association with breast cancer than a family history. So we call this the double whammy. The denser the breast, the greater the risk of getting breast cancer. Now, it is normal to have dense breasts, but women need to know if they have dense breasts so they can understand their risks. There are 3.4 million women over age 40 with dense breasts in Canada. Over 800,000 women in Canada are in the highest density category. And that also applies to women who've had cancer. They should be told whether they have dense breasts. And where does ultrasound fit in? Well, we published this paper over 25 years ago, and it was followed by work from multiple other researchers that showed that ultrasound can find cancers that are still too small to feel, and have been missed on their mammograms, largely because of dense tissue. Ultrasound can be done with a handheld probe or a large automated probe that scans about a third of the breast per scan, sometimes called ABIS, Automated Breast Ultrasound. Now, any ordinary ultrasound machine can do breast ultrasound, but not all clinics offer it. And because of the guidelines from the task force, some family doctors refuse to refer their patients for screening ultrasound. In British Columbia, we can do ultrasound for any women in category C or D with a doctor's requisition. And we're finding seven cancers per thousand exams. They're all small and node negative. The average patient age is 55. And remember, these were all cancers missed on their mammograms. 40% of those cancers were found in the first year 
um, sorry, that we found in the first year were in women with no family history, and 60% of them were in category C density breasts. Women who've had cancer, who have dense breasts, should also have access to extra screening, including ultrasound, MRI, or one of the other tests I'll describe. But here are the pros and cons of ultrasound. It's widely available, relatively expensive. It requires no intravenous injection and does not use ionizing radiation. It uses minimal pressure, so it's not uncomfortable. If we see something worrisome, it's easy to use the ultrasound to guide a needle biopsy. And it finds two to seven invasive cancers per thousand women screened. And it reduces interval cancers. On the downside, many of the biopsies that are done turn out not to be cancer, because when we see something and we're not sure that it isn't cancer, it's a better safe than sorry situation. But radiologists are getting more experience and even using automated, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence to reduce the number of biopsies done for benign lumps. But most women in Canada with dense breasts are not having ultrasound. Many of their cancers are found as a lump after a negative mammogram. Sometimes it's by doing a deliberate breast self-examination or BSE, but often they find it unexpectedly. The task force says that women shouldn't do breast self-exams and because of that, it's not formally taught. But for women with dense breasts who can't get ultrasounds, doing breast self-exam can be the difference between being diagnosed at stage one or four. Now, ideally all women, even those with category and B should do breast exams, especially given that the majority of women in Canada who will get breast cancer are only having mammograms every two years. So doing BSE might find a cancer before it's big enough to bump into unexpectedly. There are lots of demonstrations on how to do breast self-examination online, but an excel excellent one I recommend is by Dr. Liz O'Reardon, a breast cancer surgeon in the UK who has had breast cancer. Please check it out, it's only three minutes long. This photo is from a foundation called Know Your Lemons. It shows some of the ways breast cancer can manifest. They have a website and an app you should have a look at, knowyourlemons.com. I'll briefly describe some of the other tests that uh, can find cancers missed on regular mammograms. Tomosynthesis is sometimes called 3D mammography or TOMO for short. It finds more cancers than 2D and it reduces false alarms when used for screening, but it's generally not used for screening in Canada. When TOMO was introduced, we hoped that it would find all the cancers that were being missed on mammograms and that we wouldn't need to do extra screening with ultrasound for women with dense breasts. But that didn't pan out. Research done in Italy showed that ultrasound detected nearly twice as many additional cancers as TOMO. So using TOMO does not remove the need for extra screening in women with dense breasts. MRI has been used for women at very high risk for decades. It has the highest cancer detection rate, 10 to 16 per thousand in the first round. It uses no ionizing radiation. It's pr been proven to reduce interval cancers and late stage disease. But there are downsides. It requires IV gadolinium, which is known to accumulate in the brain, although as of now, there are no long-term effects. Claustrophobia can be an issue because a standard MRI requires about 45 minutes in the magnet. And in general, MRI can't be done in patients with pacemakers and other implants. It's very expensive and access in it is inadequate in many areas. There's now a faster way of doing breast MRI called abbreviated MRI. And instead of the conventional scan taking about 45 minutes, this one requires about 10 minutes in the scanner and it's faster for the radiologist to read. This makes it less expensive and it might make it more tolerable for women with claustrophobia, but it still requires intravenous gadolinium. The list of who should have an MRI is likely to change with additional research. As of now in the United States, MRIs recommended for women with a calculated lifetime risk of 20% or more, which includes women with BRCA mutations, women who've had chest radiation for lymphoma, all women who've had cancer before age 50, and women with cancer who have dense breasts. In Europe, MRIs recommended for all women in category D, but those guidelines aren't used in Canada for the most part. Another test you may have heard of for dense breasts is molecular breast imaging. It's a nuclear medicine test that was pioneered at the Mayo Clinic and it's being used there, but is not widely available. It requires an intravenous injection of a radioactive material. The radiation dose to the breast is about four times that of mammography. And in addition to the radiation to the breast, radiation from this test is to the whole body. 
It finds more cancers than ultrasound, but it takes 40 minutes to perform. And molecular breast imaging is currently not offered anywhere in Canada. An exciting new test is called contrast enhanced mammography. It's a mammogram done with the same intravenous x-ray dye that we use for CT scans. So gadolinium is not a concern. It has a similar high cancer detection rate to MRI, and it's been proposed as an excellent, excellent alternative, either when MRI is not available or for women who can't tolerate MRI. And there are more sites across Canada now starting to get this equipment. There are a couple of blood tests available, sometimes called liquid biopsies. This one is from a company based in Calgary. It's private pay, and they're charging for it, even though it hasn't finished being tested yet. It can cost between five and eight hundred dollars. And there are other screening blood tests that can cost in the thousands of dollars. And I think we can expect to hear lots more about these kinds of tests in the coming years. So to summarize, for all average risk women, optimal screening means annual mammograms starting at 40 and women should be able to self-refer, especially nowadays since so many women don't have a family doctor. Women who are at higher than average risk may, may need to start younger. Women should be able to continue having mammograms as long as they're in good health with a life expectancy of about 10 years. All women should be told their breast density and women with dense breasts should have access to supplemental screening, usually with ultrasound or MRI or not, in, not before long with contrast mammography it's a, if it's available. And for breast cancer survivors, there's lots of research showing that when a woman is unlucky to get a second cancer, her chances of dying are significantly less if that cancer is detected by mammography instead of as a lump. There's no similar research yet about finding a second cancer by ultrasound or MRI, but it's reasonable to conclude for now that the stats would be even better if those survivors who had dense breasts had supplemental screening. And it's estimated that there are 400,000 breast cancer survivors alive now in Canada. So for now, women who've had breast cancer should have annual mammograms from the time they're diagnosed. And if they're diagnosed younger than age 50 or have dense breasts, they should have supplemental MRI or ultrasound or contrast mammography. Thanks for your attention. I'm going to turn it over to Jenny now, and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you to Jackie Manthorn and CCSN for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'd also like to thank Dr. Gordon for all the educating and advocating she does for Canadian women. I've included this slide because we do a lot of advocacy and we get asked who funds Dense Breast Canada. We made a decision when we launched that we wouldn't accept funds from imaging or breast screening related companies. We're grateful for donations from the public and we're a nonprofit. We're made up of volunteers and patient advocates and we don't have any salaries. In this talk, I'm going to be referring to Dense Breast Canada as DBC. I'll use the term jurisdictions when talking about provinces and territories together. And please accept my use of the word doctor to apply to any healthcare provider, including nurse practitioners. DBC is happy to see our screening programs addressing barriers impacting access to screening. These barriers impact minority, indigenous and immigrant women women in remote areas, and women with low incomes. The work being done is so important, but there are many more issues to be addressed, primarily flawed and inconsistent screening policies in Canada. Today, I'll be discussing inequities in screening practices, knowledge gaps doctors and women may have about optimal screening, and ways we can all advocate for better breast screening and surveillance. Before I do that, I'd like to give you just a bit of background about me and DBC. I'm a mom of four, I live in Ontario, and I'm an example of why early detection matters. Years ago, I went for my routine annual mammogram, annual because my sister had breast cancer. My doctor gave me two requisitions for that day, one for a screening mammogram and one for a screening ultrasound. My mammogram was clear, but 20 minutes later, my life turned into a before and after when the technician said, I'm going to go get the radiologist. Breast cancer has left me with emotional and physical scars, but as Dr. Gordon pointed out, it can be less toxic and debilitating when cancer is found early. I was able to avoid chemotherapy and make that five-year 100% survival rate. 
Not long after my diagnosis, I learned about dense breasts for the first time. I couldn't believe health information was being withheld from women. I was introduced via email to a woman in British Columbia who felt the same way I did. Michelle de Tomaso and I, complete strangers, decided to launch DBC. We're grateful Dr. Gordon agreed to be our volunteer medical advisor. Our goals have evolved because we hear from women with delayed diagnoses who were not informed of their breast density, women denied mammograms and ultrasound, and women dismissed by doctors. Overall, we're advocating that all women get the information they need and have access to the screening and surveillance they need so that cancer can be found early. When DPC began advocating, women weren't being told their breast density. In 2018, we had our first success when BC became the first province to inform all women of their density after a mammogram. We now have six provinces informing all women. Saskatchewan will begin notification next year. Ontario is updating its system, and we're hoping all women will soon be informed in Ontario too. That would make eight provinces. DBC also advocates federally for the revision of our dangerous breast screening guidelines, which Dr. Gordon discussed. We're asking, why are 50,000 doctors given breast screening guidelines that are made by, not, sorry, not made by experts and that ignore current scientific evidence? Why are our screening programs using these guidelines? We have over 5,000 Canadian women dying every year from breast cancer. That should not be. Modeling by Ontario's Dr. Martin Yaffe shows if the task force guidelines are followed, there will be more than 1,000 avoidable deaths every year. This chart shows the recommendations from the experts from the Canadian Society of Breast Imaging and the Canadian Association of Radiologists. They're based on current evidence and differ in every way from the task force guidelines. They need to be adopted to save lives and we need to make this happen through education and advocacy. Last summer, DBC checked in with our 12 screening programs to learn more about their practices and how they compare to the recommendations of experts. We found differences across the country in the age screening begins and ends and the policies used for women in the 40s, over age 74, and women with dense breasts. These inconsistent policies result in inequities. As Dr. Gordon explained, Screening in the 40s can be life-saving, but looking at the left column, we only have four jurisdictions allowing women to self-refer for a mammogram at 40. Elsewhere, a woman needs a requisition from her family doctor. But what about the 300,000 women aged 40 to 49 that don't have a family doctor? Dr. Gordon also explained how cancer in the 40s can grow aggressively because of hormones. But as you see in the second column from the left, we only have four jurisdictions where women can self-refer every year for a mammogram. Dr. Gordon showed the importance of knowing your breast density, but we only have six jurisdictions directly informing all women. And we only have six jurisdictions asking women with category D density to return for a mammogram every year instead of every two, even though a recent Canadian study showed that screening every year leads to fewer interval cancer cases. Dr. Gordon explained that category C and D are both dense breasts, but five jurisdictions are only informing women in category D, leaving over half a million women with category C in the dark. Even though mammograms are not enough for women with dense breasts, as Dr. Gordon explained, no screening program officially recommends supplemental screening for women with dense breasts. Dr. Gordon also explained why women should continue having mammograms after age 75, but as seen on the right, only seven jurisdictions allow women to self-refer after 75. Not included here are the significant differences across Canada when it comes to women at high risk and how they're assessed and the screening offered. The Canada Health Act suggests that Canadians should have uniform access to insured health services. This isn't the case. Access to breast cancer screening and therefore risk of a later stage diagnosis varies depending on where women in Canada live. This chart is summary chart compares the provinces on six key practices that promote early detection of breast cancer. And you can see that Yukon leads the way with five out of six, and then it goes downhill from there. Quebec has zero of these practices implemented. DPC found these disparities highly concerning 
And so we created a new website called mybreastscreening.ca to inform women of the practices in their jurisdiction, how those practices differ from experts' recommendations, and how they could self-advocate for better screening. As well, DBC launched a survey last summer to understand a woman's experiences with breast screening. 2,500 women responded. DBC also launched a second survey this winter to understand the screening experiences of women with dense breasts. There were 1,650 respondents. I'd like to share a few of the survey findings which demonstrate the themes we saw. 42% of respondents didn't know when they could start screening. Even in British Columbia, where women may self-refer at 40, half of the women didn't know. We need to ensure women know when to begin screening and why. 40% of respondents reported their discussion with their doctor didn't help them make an informed decision about screening. The premise of the task force guidelines is that there will be shared decision making between women and doctors. That requires accurate information. But as Dr. Gordon discussed, harms of screening are overestimated and benefits underestimated. There's confusion and a lack of access around screening at age 40. For women age 40 to 49, the majority didn't know the decision whether to have a mammogram was theirs. The task force guideline actually indicates that the decision to screen is a woman's based on how she values the possible benefits and harms. In Ontario, 66% of respondents in their 40s were unaware of this, which may account for why only 4% of women in their 40s are being screened in Ontario. We actually have an email from the chair of the task force agreeing that this information has not been effectively communicated to women and doctors. Here's a survey comment we received. I asked at 40 for a mammogram and was told I didn't need one if I didn't have symptoms and that Ontario didn't do them until 50. I'm now 44 and have just been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. If I had access to one earlier, the cancer may have been found sooner. We hear stories like this too often. The survey showed 11% of women who asked for a mammogram in their 40s were denied a requisition by their family doctors who quoted the task force guidelines. This is of additional significance to Black, Asian, and Hispanic women since they're more likely to get cancer in the 40s. This survey responded from Quebec, where screening begins at 50 and women are not told their density, wrote, I was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 42. Had I known I had dense breasts, I may have been able to avoid the devastating consequences of a delayed diagnosis, including mastectomy and chemotherapy. A third of the survey respondents didn't know the risks associated with dense breasts. Over half of women surveyed with dense breasts said they never had a discussion with their doctor about their density. About a third said their doctor negated the risk of dense breasts and didn't tell them any way to be proactive. This indicates a lack of awareness among doctors and the general public of breast density risks. This woman with dense breasts had a clear mammogram in 2018 and was diagnosed with a six centimeter tumor 10 months later. She hadn't been given additional screening. Even though tumors can be missed in dense breasts, up to 40% of the time, women and doctors lack awareness of the need for additional screening. 78% of women surveyed had not asked for a screening ultrasound. For women with breast cancer and dense breasts, 69% had never asked for ultrasound. Experts recommend MRI for women with dense breasts and cancer, but many women have enough trouble accessing ultrasound, let alone MRI. But we have to continue to ask and be persistent if we want change. This woman wrote, Nova Scotia does not offer breast screening ultrasound. Even after being diagnosed with breast cancer and knowing that I have category C dense breast tissue, I had to go to Ontario for an ultrasound at my own expense. Supplemental screening is denied in Nova Scotia, even when a requisition from a doctor is sent in. Elsewhere, women can advocate for ultrasound. Women in Alberta and BC have relatively easy access to supplemental screening. As Dr. Gordon discussed, there are many technologies for screening and surveillance, but our access to technology is limited and inconsistent. 3D automated breast ultrasound for screening women with dense breasts is widely available only in Alberta. Diagnostic contrast enhanced mammography, 
which can find cancers in dense breasts, is available in only 30 clinics in Canada. 3D mammograms are available for screening only in Alberta, unless you're part of a study, and in other areas, they are used for diagnostic purposes. Abbreviated MRI is primarily available in Ottawa. Women above age 75 reported feeling dismissed. As this woman wrote, since I turned 75 in April, I was sent a notice that I will not be eligible for a mammogram unless my doctor orders it. Guess when you get old, you're not worth the expense of a mammogram. Younger women also felt dismissed. The incidence among young women is increasing, but there's a lack of awareness that young women can get breast cancer. Some younger women wrote, they went to their doctors with symptoms, but were dismissed as being too young for breast cancer. We have stories like this on our website. Stories of dismissal are not limited to young women, and our hope is that any woman presenting with the symptom will insist on imaging. To save lives and save women from the horrible consequences of later stage diagnoses, action is needed immediately. And here's what we need to see. Screening program policies should be consistent across Canada. All programs should send invite letters to women so they'll know when they're eligible. All should allow women to self-refer every year, starting at 40. Newfoundland and Quebec need to update their software to include the density category so women will know their risk. Jurisdictions need to increase resources so that all women with dense breasts can access supplemental screening and surveillance. All women in good health should be able to self-refer past 74. Let's close the gap in education for physicians and women and have informed discussions with family doctors. Family doctors can use a risk assessment calculator starting at age 25 to 30. Let's increase the optimal use of technology. Let's evaluate the blood tests on the market to see if they can effectively fill the gap in screening for women too young to have a mammogram. The federal government must act to reform the task force to include experts and make sure the recommendations align with current evidence. This is a long list I've just read, but our past success shows us that change can happen when patients, public and doctors come together. So, what can you do to help champion better screening? The most important thing you can do is to prioritize your health by being informed so you can self-advocate for the screening or surveillance you need. Please also help us spread the word. Tell your friends, family, co-workers what you've learned. Please encourage your contacts to find out their density and start screening in the 40s. Let us know if you know anywhere that experts like Dr. Gordon can run a webinar or any opportunities for them to write an article for, corporate, for a corporate newsletter or wellness page. Consider sharing your story with us. We'd love for you to share our social media. Please consider joining our dedicated volunteers to help educate doctors and women. Here are ways to help with advocacy. Help us connect with MPs, MLAs, MPPs, and contact your health minister Health Ministry, we have briefing notes to send. Help us engage and create partnerships with other women's groups. You can send our template letter to your provincial government. We have copies of that on both our websites. And we'd love for you to join our team of advocates and be a voice for women in your province. Today, I've addressed some of the inequities in screening, but not all. There are many more issues being experienced by women with and without breast cancer. Let's work together to bring optimal screening to Canada. Thank you very much. Dr. Gordon and I are happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for um, the, these insightful presentations. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the questions that came in now. I don't know if uh, Dr. Gordon wants to join us on camera or if she's um, able to do that. Um, but um, there are a number of questions that are here. Um, uh, I'll start with, with this first one. Um, oh, there's more, there's more coming in, I'm losing it. 
Um, there, there's a question here about task force versus experts um, and what, what the difference is in the two. Um, and if there are any regulatory bodies that, um, that don't include experts, and then there's a, a further follow-up after that, but but maybe we'll address the the first issue of um, task force versus experts. Thank you. Issue. I think you, I think you did that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So the task force is funded by the Ministry of Health through the Public Health Agency of Canada, and. Um, they are what's called um, hands-off and um, they let this task force make the guidelines and there is no expert oversight. In fact, the task force in, uh, claims to have consulted experts and I was one of many that they consulted, but we all know each other and they ignored all of our input. Uh, the task force claims that the reason that they can't include experts is because of conflict of interest. They claim uh, that we are going to make recommendations that benefit us financially. I will say on this uh, platform that I'm semi-retired and I barely read screening mammograms anymore. Um, so I have, I'm not gonna earn any more money if we screen more women. And, um, and uh, we are not just making the claim uh, out of thin air, we are using it based on the data, some of which I've shown you today. Okay, that's awesome, thank you. Um, another for uh, for Dr. Gordon, uh, could an MRI without contrast be used instead of one with contrast by those with dense breast tissue? As some private clinics offer. Uh, sorry, there's just a, a follow-up, but I'll let you uh, address it first. Uh, that's a really good question and one I hear often. And the answer is at the moment, no. There are uh, ways of doing breast, uh, breast MR without contrast, but they're not as sensitive. And uh, we're, more research is being done. One of, one of the ways is called diffusion-weighted imaging. And hopefully one day that will be the case. In the meantime, you should know though, that contrast-enhanced mammography, which does not use gadolinium, is, has been shown to find uh, almost as many cancers as MRI, and it has fewer false alarms. Awesome, thank you. Um, one, this, one, this one's got a bit of a preamble, all right? So, uh, I, I believe this person has, um, it sounds like they've had uh, breast cancer before, perhaps twice. Um, they've gone from high density now and uh, to now being in their older age to a density of only 25%. Um, it was ultrasound both times that found the breast cancer, not mammograms or the mammograph. Um, and in PEI, they will not do ultrasound as a follow-up, but recommend uh, just uh, an annual mammogram for those who have uh, breast, who have had uh, breast cancer previously. Um, but now they're, they're wondering um, how to monitor the remaining tissue, even though they're only at, at 25%. Is the mammogram likely enough at this point? The mammogram is far more likely if their breast density has changed, which can not, not only happen with age, but it can happen with um, tamoxifen, which is often given after, or, or other anti-estrogen drugs that are often given as part of breast cancer treatment. Um, um, it's really unfortunate that both of their cancers were detected only with ultrasound and they're being denied, but obviously um, doing breast self-examination is certainly worth considering and advocating in PEI for ultrasound. The only way we got it in British Columbia was not by doctors telling them they should do it. It was be it was because of women, uh, patient advocates uh, going to their uh, provincial legislators and pushing for change. So don't give up just because it's not allowed. Push for it. Um, how would one find out if uh, what category of, of breast density they are in? They, uh, this person says they know uh, they have dense breasts, but they've never been told that, um, what category they belong to. Um, so that's a really good question. And uh, Jenny referred to some of those answers. Um, the way a lot of women are starting to find out is because when they have a screening mammogram, and get a copy of the report from the screening program, it should tell them their density. And some provinces are telling them whether they're A, B, C, or D. Other provinces are only telling women who are D. 
Again, that's something you have to push for. Now, those are screening mammograms on women who haven't had cancer. Sure. Any woman who's having surveillance mammography after treatment for breast cancer, her diagnostic report should include that piece of information. And the Canadian Society of Breast Imaging and the Canadian Association of Radiologists are pushing to make sure that that information is on every report. So if you ask your doctor, maybe they'll even give you a copy of the, that report and you can see for yourself whether they mentioned density. And if they didn't, you should ask your doctor to phone the radiologist and ask them to look at that mammogram again and include that missing information because it is it is crucial. Um, there's uh, one here about thermography. Um, this is an assessment that is out of pocket, but do you see it bringing any value in uh, early assessment of Desperance issues? No. <laughs> and you can look on the uh, the FDA site. A website says conclusively that thermography is not uh, effective for early detection of breast cancer. It, it's, it can find big cancers close to the skin. The way thermography works is the woman goes into a cold room and her body, you know, cools off her body. And then they use a thermal camera to image her breasts and look for hot spots. But normal tissue can look hot. Non-cancerous tumors can look hot in addition to cancers and small cancers that are deeper in the breast, not close to the skin where the camera's gonna see them are missed. They also, um, a, an extraordinary number, uh, say, well, there's a little something and maybe you should repeat it in three months. And when you're paying privately to repeat it in three months when we know it doesn't work. Um, and can I just throw something else in? Cause I didn't touch on this. I think a lot of women turn to thermography because they're, they think, that the radiation from mammography is dangerous. It is not. The risk of radiation to the breast start after age 40 is negligible. You get the same amount of radiation every day from natural sources just by living on earth for seven weeks at sea level. You get the same amount of radiation from a mammogram in three weeks time if you live at elevation like in Denver or, or you know high up and high up. So uh, the radiation is not, even the task force didn't worry about radiation. It's not a reason to not have a mammogram, and we know that they work. Wow, fantastic answer. Thank you so much. Um, what about women uh, under 40, and what can they do in their 20s and 30s to, to begin kind of self-screening self or, or other kinds of screening? So breast self-examination, definitely. And um, women need to know, especially if they're doing it for the very first time, that all women have lumpiness and texture in their breasts. So don't freak out when you think you feel something. Get to know what your normal feels like. And the goal of breast self-examination is to recognize if there's a change. In fact, the new term for breast self-exam, because that's gone out of favor, is being breast aware. Well, you can't be aware if you don't know what your normal feels like. So they used to say that women had to do it every month just after their period. You know, nobody's that diligent. And even if women do breast self-exam only periodically, they're much more likely to notice a subtle change in their texture than a healthcare provider like their, like their family doctor. So that's definitely something younger women can do. Now, younger women, I'm, we're talking average risk. If a young woman has a family history of breast cancer, she should have a risk assessment depending, you know, between ages 25 and 30. And um, if a woman has a mother or sister who got breast cancer younger than age 50, she should start screening mammograms younger than age 40. Um, but these liquid biopsies, if they can get them down in price, might be a, a good way for younger women in the future, but not now. To get them down in price, uh, they're going to be rolling out across Canada, so hopefully they will decrease. That's great, great information. Thank you. Um, we have one coming from uh, Nova Scotia. This person says they've been diagnosed with breast cancer stage three uh, for now and are waiting on the results of a CAT scan. Um, but they were surprised to hear that they should have been told about their breast density. Uh, who should they be asking this, uh, this information from out, out east to Nova Scotia or anywhere? Well, there's no should. That's ideal. Mm -hmm. But many provinces don't. And if that particular person or any woman uh, who's been diagnosed with breast cancer doesn't know their breast density, um, 
they should know, even, even if they had, for example, um, a lump and then had a diagnostic mammogram rather than a screening mammogram, their density information should be on the report of that diagnostic mammogram and their doctor should share a copy with them and uh, and let them see. Every woman should know her breast. It's like you should know your blood pressure. You should know your cholesterol level. Breast density is not much different. For sure. Um, should someone with dense breasts take HRT? Um, any woman who's having uh, disabling menopausal symptoms you know, may be offered uh, hormone replacement therapy, or now it's just called menopause hormone therapy. And it's thought that taking hormones for five to seven years is probably safe. Now you might temper that if, for example, a woman has a strong family history and she takes, uh, takes hormones. But women, um, the, the advice from the North American Menopause Society is that women should take the lowest possible dose for the shortest possible period of time. And, uh, any you know long-term use of hormones, um, and I'm talking about combined hormones here now, estrogen plus progesterone, is associated with increased breast cancer risk. Now, interestingly, even in the studies that showed hormones were dangerous, the women who were just on estrogen and the women who are just on estrogen who don't have to take progesterone are women who've had a hysterectomy. And there's some evidence that estrogen alone can not only be not dangerous, it can even be protective against breast cancer. But women who haven't had a hysterectomy need to take the combined therapy if they're going to take hormones. And that is the one that in the long term can increase breast cancer risk. Um, is, is there a difference or what is the difference in efficacy between regular ultrasounds and ABUS or ABUS? Well, it depends what study you read. Um, uh, recent summaries have claimed that they're identical. Um, in my hands, the, well, in our clinic's hands, the handheld ultrasound done by technologists is fantastic, seven cancers per thousand. That's higher than most of the studies in the published literature. But um, there are pros and cons to each, and, if, and some clinics offer only one or the other, so take what you can get. Um, when you do ABUS and you find an abnormality, you don't even know yet if it's a cancer sometimes, then you need a handheld anyway. So if, if, a, if a clinic is experienced and has, you know, can get experienced in doing handheld, it'll save time in the long run. We've got two more questions uh, and just in time. Um, the first question is, uh, are Ontario doctors permitted to refuse a regular ultrasound request? Uh, yeah, I guess they're permitted. Whether that's right is another story. Jenny, can you jump in on this one? You're muted. No, ju it, it just cut off the first couple of words. Go ahead. Policy from the screening program on that, but it is up to the individual woman to self-advocate on our websites, on both sites, we have a what we call a script uh, that women can take with them or read beforehand that goes over the potential arguments that they may face from their doctor and how to address those arguments. You know, we hear from women all over the country that are able to self-advocate for ultrasound and MRI. So it, you know, you have it's all about being informed and empowered. Um, and lastly, just if you can remind us, uh, Dr. Gordon, of the um, of the name of the doctor and the website of the video of how to perform the self exam. Yes, and and you're you're all going to get a copy of the webinar, so I didn't spend a lot of time letting you copy it down. Her name is Dr. Liz O'Riordan. Awesome. And, and is there a, a website associated with it, or do you just type that into the YouTube bar? It's I know okay. that I know that I everyone's going to get. The, the link that I provided is, is a YouTube, but she, I mean, she does have a website and she's a very active on social media. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think that uh, brings this Q&A session to a close. We've answered uh, most of the questions here. Um, well, all of them. I'm, I'm going to address the, the few that are remaining.
uh, simply about resources. So again, this video or this webinar is being recorded and we will also be publishing the, um, the both slide decks of both presenters with all the information that you can find there. Um, watch out for that in your inboxes tomorrow um, as, as you know, once these things get uploaded to YouTube and, and slide share the, um, the other platform we use to, to share the slide decks, we'll be sending that out to the email you used when you registered. So look out for that tomorrow. Um, and, and really just, uh, we wanna thank both of our presenters on behalf of CCSN, Dr. Paula Gordon and Jenny Dale for joining us today for an incredible, um, an incredibly insightful presentation and all the work that you do for the cancer community around our country. And so we really just wanna thank you. We really appreciate your time today. Um, this that, is one in a series. This is one in a series of webinars that uh, we have going on in 2022. Registration information for our next webinar, which will be May 12th, will be out shortly. So watch your inboxes and social media feeds for that. A quick note about email. I've talked uh, already a little bit about it, but if you're not seeing our emails in your inbox, please check your spam or junk mail folders. We use a third party email service. So uh, check your spam folder, mark emails from CCSN as safe or add us to your contact list and ensure that they come straight into your inbox and you won't miss any of these notifications. As always, all of our previous webinars are accessible um, on demand through our website at survivornet.ca slash webinars. Um, and so we just wanna thank you again for joining us today and, um, and we hope that you have a great day.